Commissioned at the Philadelphia Navy Yard on February 25, 1943, the USS Princeton CVL-23, a 600-foot light carrier, met its tragic end in the late Gulf on October 24, 1944, after a valiant 20-month service in an effort to liberate the Philippines from Japanese control. As part of Task Group 38.3, Princeton, alongside another light carrier, launched 23 fighters and 10 torpedo bombers. It's likely that only another survivor and I witnessed the initial blast that led to Princeton's sinking, as everyone else in a position to observe the explosion was killed instantly. The destruction of Princeton resulted in 347 deaths, 552 injuries, and four individuals unaccounted for. However, the majority of these casualties occurred not on Princeton but on the USS Birmingham, a light cruiser aiding the damaged carrier after it was hit by a single enemy aircraft. Aboard Birmingham, where I was stationed, 230 were killed, 408 injured, and 4 went missing. The devastation wrought by a lone Japanese Yokosuka D-4Y Judy dive bomber, dropping two 550-pound bombs, seemed unsurpassable appearing more the result of a fortuitous attack than a carefully orchestrated plan. The aftermath of the Judy's attack eventually claimed my right leg below the knee, effectively leaving me with one foot in the grave. Birmingham had been at sea for eight months, joining Task Group 38.3 in August 1944. Over eight weeks, this group inflicted considerable damage across the Palau and Philippine Islands, culminating in extensive airstrikes over Luzon from October 18 to 23 in a campaign to reclaim the Philippines. The morning of October 24 began with partly cloudy skies and intermittent squalls, yet visibility remained good enough to support ongoing airstrikes and late support. With general quarters declared before dawn for Task Force 38, Princeton dispatched 20 fighters into the aerial fray over Late Gulf. Despite facing two waves of Japanese aircraft totaling 70 to 80 planes, Princeton's aviators managed to down 34 enemy fighters with just a single loss, rapidly earning ace status. These aircraft then regrouped on the carrier, readying for a significant strike against a Japanese fleet near Mindoro, comprised of four battleships, eight cruisers, and 13 destroyers. At 9.12 a.m., the USS Essex identified a suspected enemy aircraft along with a friendly one, approximately 6 miles distant, with no other unknown aircraft within 25 miles. By 9.38 a.m., Princeton's lookouts detected a lone Judy dive bomber emerging from low clouds ahead, targeting their ship. The incoming plane was met with immediate anti-aircraft fire from Princeton's forward 20mm and 40mm guns as the ship attempted evasive maneuvers to port. The Judy released two bombs, one missed splashing harmlessly into the sea, while the other, a 550-pound bomb, struck near the center of Princeton's deck. The impact was felt as a heavy jolt on the bridge and a muted thump in the central station, followed by black smoke billowing from the flight deck's breach, the forward elevator, and all hangar access points aft of the superstructure. Radar operator Ed Butler observed the Japanese pilot retreating, smoke trailing behind him. Crew member Pete Callan, who had been arming and refueling the torpedo bombers, reported hearing machine gun fire unlike any on board Princeton, with bullets hitting the wooden flight deck. Decades later, he recalled the Japanese pilot's tactic of using the gunfire to adjust his bombing accuracy. The bomb pierced the flight deck, creating a roughly 15-inch jagged aperture, then severed the main fuel line, igniting a fire as it continued through a parked torpedo bomber and detonated in the crew's galley on the second deck causing extensive damage through to the third deck above the aft engine room. Though the structural damage was somewhat contained, a severe gasoline fire ensued, quickly engulfing Mooney's aircraft and spreading to five others in the hangar. The exact volume of gasoline spilled from the ruptured main is unclear, but together, the aircraft contained over 2,500 gallons of fuel. The initial blast had formed a five-foot crater around the entry hole, funneling the spilling gasoline into the lower decks, igniting multiple fires. In less than 10 minutes post-impact, the fire suppression systems failed and the main engines lost power, leaving Princeton immobilized and ablaze. Numerous accounts in American naval history label USS Birmingham as one of the most tragic ships of World War II due to its many battles and injuries. 
Similarly, Princeton could be considered extraordinarily unfortunate, as a single bomb, seemingly a minor threat to the robust carrier, inflicted significant casualties and destruction. Lieutenant Mooney recounted his experience. I was in the pilot's ready room located directly beneath the flight deck on the port side forward of the hangar when the bomb penetrated the flight deck. We, the TBM pilots, heard a noise akin to a heavy object falling somewhere nearby. Curiously, the door to the companionway, which is usually shut, was open at that moment. As Mooney glanced towards the door, he witnessed an unforgettable sight. A fireball, resembling a sphere of burning flame about the size of a basketball, shot past the open door of the ready room through the companionway. Without hesitation, Mooney and the pilots evacuated through an emergency exit to the portside catwalk, and then ascended to the flight deck to find a scene of organized turmoil with each person vigorously and adeptly fulfilling their roles. Without specific assignments, Mooney took up a fire hose and joined others in attempting to quench the flames through the forward elevator shaft just beneath the flight deck. Amid their efforts, an explosive force ejected the elevator platform from its shaft, sending Mooney reeling backward, fortunately unscathed. Meanwhile, the hangar's fire suppression system had failed, likely due to the fire compromising the electrical systems controlling the hangar's firefighting equipment. Within 10 minutes of the bomb's impact, Princeton fell out of the battle group's formation. The destroyers Irwin, Cassin Young, Gatlin, and the anti-aircraft cruiser Reno were directed to assist Princeton. From its deck, minor explosions were felt, and approximately 12 men trapped in the executive officer's office suffered severe burns, unreachable due to scalding water covering the decks. 18 minutes post-impact, the pilot house lost steering control. The Irwin positioned itself alongside Princeton's port to combat the fire, but was too small to make a significant difference against the intense blaze. Over 600 Princeton crew members were evacuated onto the Irwin, which suffered damage and engine issues due to collisions with Princeton amidst moderate swells. Continued explosions on Princeton forced the Irwin to disengage to avoid further damage. The Reno tried to assist from Princeton's starboard side, but struggled due to the carrier's drifting. About 90 minutes after the strike, the Birmingham was tasked to lead the firefighting efforts, approaching Princeton from the port side. Given their similar hull designs, Birmingham withstood the conditions better than the Irwin. However, the Reno's efforts to wedge itself between the two ships for firefighting were unsuccessful and it withdrew once the fire had significantly died down. Birmingham then advanced on Princeton's port side, the two ships repeatedly colliding in the swells. The sight of the two vessels battering each other was distressing, as if they were trying to cause mutual destruction. For Birmingham to effectively assist in firefighting, it was essential to maintain close proximity to Princeton, allowing crew members to transition between the ships. To achieve this, Birmingham intentionally pressed close to Princeton, whose anti-torpedo blisters, bulges designed to absorb torpedo impacts, restricted other vessels to approaching only from the bow or stern. After a long night of repairs in Birmingham's after-engine room, I, alongside Vernon Trevithan and George Thompson, was released from duty. Off-duty and not under general quarters, we decided to explore. We climbed to the open bridge above the starboard flying bridge, aiming to watch the firefighting on Princeton while keeping out of the way. The interaction between Birmingham's starboard and Princeton's port sides had caused significant damage due to the repeated impacts as Birmingham tried to facilitate the efforts of the firefighters on both vessels. The continuous collisions had torn a hatch door from Princeton, revealing what seemed to be a companionway. Looking back, the sight is terrifying, but at 23, the danger didn't faze me as much. Inside, we spotted a lineup of bombs, each about 5 feet tall and 12 inches in diameter, standing upright. Birmingham's firefighters were dousing these bombs with water, which hissed and steamed like water on a hot pan, a task made challenging by the cramped space and the ship's movements. From less than 20 feet away, we observed this tense scene. Below us, Captain Thomas Inglis, Birmingham's commander, oversaw the operation, his serious demeanor reflecting the gravity of the situation. Three hours and seven minutes post-hit, the destroyer Morrison approached Princeton's starboard side. Soon after, a jeep and an aircraft towing tractor tumbled from Princeton onto Morrison's bridge. Fifteen minutes later, Morrison got trapped between Princeton's second and third smokestacks, 
causing its mass to bend and eventually snap. By 1.32 p.m., as Birmingham disengaged due to potential air and submarine threats, it activated general quarters. Despite the ongoing fires and smoke from Princeton, as we moved to the carrier starboard side, we could see Morrison stuck in its awkward position. The sight of Morrison with its mast bent sharply provoked laughter among Birmingham's crew. Soon after, we dispersed to our battle stations. Four hours and 16 minutes following the Judy's assault, Morrison managed to free itself and rejoined the protective formation of destroyers, dragging its damaged mast. Reno engaged enemy aircraft although a full-scale attack never materialized. Roughly 90 minutes after the all-clear ended general quarters, Birmingham once again positioned itself alongside Princeton. My group gathered again, this time settling on the after-mushroom ventilator between turrets 3 and 4, keenly observing Princeton as Birmingham prepared for a towing operation. From our vantage point, approximately 50 to 75 yards away, we noticed no signs of smoke or fire, merely mist-like vapors escaping from the various openings on Princeton's flight deck, giving the impression that the carrier was calmly adrift and that the fires had extinguished themselves. We thought the ordeal had ended and the fires on Princeton were out. While the ships remained about 50 feet apart, the crew began to shoot messenger lines across to secure a towing line. Suddenly, George beside me shouted, noticing a burst of flame near the after elevator quickly followed by a massive cloud of white smoke that billowed like a voluminous cumulus cloud. Then a shocking explosion ensued, sending a towering plume of pale orange smoke hundreds of feet into the air. In an instant, the stern and a large portion of Princeton's flight deck were obliterated. Reacting instinctively to the approaching shockwave, I threw myself backward, avoiding the full brunt of the blast. This quick reaction likely saved my life, but the shockwave still hurled me a considerable distance, tumbling me through the air before I landed hard on the deck. I felt the explosion's force just moments before its sound reached me. In the chaos, I saw my best friend Vernon being thrown through the air as well. He managed to land on his feet and dashed behind a turret, only to collapse out of my view. Later, I found out, fatally, dazed but acutely aware, the explosion's immediate silence was overwhelming, a deafening quiet that felt almost tangible. This silence was eventually pierced by the sound of scorching shrapnel raining down, burning through my clothing at countless points. Desperate to escape this fiery downpour, I attempted to move, but my right knee was severely injured, and my left leg was broken, rendering me immobile. Attempting to crawl only exacerbated the pain, as the deck was littered with sharp fragments that scorched my skin. In agony, I could do nothing but roll on the deck seeking relief from the burns. Eventually, the shrapnel ceased, and the metal cooled down. As I regained some composure, I was confronted with a devastating sight. Among the approximately 300 crew members nearby, only one other person besides myself was conscious. Surrounded by an unsettling silence, devoid of any cries of pain. Lying on my back, elbows propping me up, I took in the grim scene around me. All around, the aftermath was like a scene from a horror story, with blood flowing into the sea through the scuppers. Amidst this chaos, my shipmate John Mixis emerged, his face and body blackened by soot, unrecognizable until he spoke. His panic contrasted with my numbed calmness as he frantically patted my cheeks, a gesture I found annoying in my dazed state. Angrily, I told him to stop. He hurried off, promising to return with help, and soon encountered another crewmate, Dick Stern. Together, they dismantled a bunk to use as a makeshift stretcher and hurried back to transport me to a first aid station. As I waited, the horrifying view of dismembered limbs and blood was all I could see. My close friend on the Birmingham, Gerald Baldwin, whom I considered a brother, was near the number four turret when Princeton's stern was destroyed. The blast threw Baldy overboard, leaving him dazed and injured, with a piece of shrapnel lodged in his shoulder. As the Birmingham repositioned, he found himself drifting past the bow to the starboard side, not far from Princeton's remains. Trying to climb aboard Princeton's floating stern proved impossible due to its slippery surface, so he moved to cling to the protective guard of Birmingham's second screw. The danger was real, as the ship's movements threatened to pull him under towards the rotating blades, though he narrowly avoided being caught each time. Realizing the peril of his situation, Baldy aimed for the stern of the Birmingham, where ladder rungs led up from the waterline. 
However, the lowest rungs were missing, and only the swells of the sea allowed him to reach the remaining ones. Exhausted from his ordeal and weakened by the cold Pacific waters, he eventually lost his grip and fell back into the sea. Floating there, Baldy understood the grim odds of survival if he stayed put. Spotting two wooden planks amidst an oil slick, he saw his chance. He managed to reach them and secured himself atop, floating until the destroyer Cassin Young spotted and rescued him from the treacherous waters. On the Princeton, a mere four individuals astonishingly survived the massive blast that erupted from near the after elevator on the hangar deck, despite being roughly 280 to 300 feet away from the explosion's epicenter. Gene Mitchell, among the survivors, was notably injured. Gathering his wits, he cast a glance towards the Birmingham, witnessing a scene so horrific and blood-stained that it haunted him with flashbacks for years, echoing the gruesome sights I had seen. The swift actions of my crewmates on that day were crucial to my survival, though my memories of the events that followed remain hazy. Since departing San Francisco on February 18, 1944, Birmingham had spent months at sea, occasionally docking at sweltering, mosquito-ridden tropical islands for supplies or repairs, entrenched in combat for two consecutive months. It was during a rare quiet moment, while I was off duty, that my active participation in the war came to an abrupt halt. Years later I encountered a former Navy man who had been at the Mare Island Navy Yard when the Birmingham arrived for post-battle repairs. He recounted how civilian workers, brought in for the cleanup, refused to undertake the task due to the unbearable odor of decay that lingered even after three months, leading to the assignment of a naval crew for the job. Despite the severe damage and the catastrophic final explosion, the Princeton remarkably remained afloat without listing, likely aided by its anti-torpedo blisters that enhanced its stability. Reluctantly, the Princeton's captain ordered the damage control team to evacuate to the destroyer Gatling as the decision was made to scuttle the Valiant carrier with torpedoes. The Irwin's attempts to sink the Princeton were fraught with difficulties. Its first torpedo, launched from 2,500 yards, had no effect, nor did a second attempt. A third torpedo, launched and traveling correctly for 1,500 yards, alarmingly turned back towards the Irwin forcing the destroyer to evade its own weapon. Subsequent attempts with the fourth and fifth torpedoes also failed. Later investigations revealed damage to Irwin's torpedo tubes from its earlier engagements with the Princeton. The task of destroying the carrier ultimately fell to the Reno. The anti-aircraft cruiser successfully launched two torpedoes into Princeton's main magazine, where around 70 tons of explosives awaited. The resulting blast was immense, sending the Princeton to the bottom of the Pacific within approximately 45 seconds. The ship did not succumb easily, proving its resilience to the very end, 